Hello, I'm Micah Terrell with Govs TV and 91.9 Public Affairs. Well, the first presidential debate is in the books. And what did you take away from that fireworks show? Well, here with me today is Dr. David Canervo of Austin Peay's Political Science Department. Dr. Canervo, wow, what a debate. What did you take away from that? Well, it was certainly a debate not like we have seen in, in recent years. Uh, I think in the uh, almost 40 years of presidential debates that uh, this has certainly been uh, one for the books, one that uh, certainly is, is quite different from what we have seen in the past. Uh, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, uh, former Secretary of State Clinton showed up uh, well prepared, that uh, she spent a lot of time apparently practicing and, and thinking about different scenarios and how she would respond to them, whereas Donald Trump um, was Donald Trump. He uh, did what he did during the uh, Republican debates, which is uh, uh, not do a lot of preparation, but simply give uh, uh, generalizations uh, about uh, directions he would like to go, but uh, no, re de no real details about his policies. Now, of course, that lasted only about 20 or 30 minutes, and then the uh, personal attacks began. They did, and they were fast and furious. For and, sure. and they were, and uh, the debate uh, ended up being primarily uh, one of personal attacks for the last hour or so. Unfortunately, I would argue, because uh, it didn't provide a lot of uh, illumination to the uh, viewing public about uh, what direction either candidate would go. Uh, they used some of their stock uh, mm -hmm. campaign lines that we had heard before. And so, uh, unfortunately, there was not a lot of light shed on uh, new ideas or new directions. And certainly for those who had not been following the campaign very uh, closely, um, it was unfortunately devolved into uh, one of... Uh, Mr. Trump having to defend himself against lots of charges. He did, definitely. And that was what was troubling to me, too. It's like, like you said, if somebody who didn't know a lot of the issues and the stances that those candidates had, there wouldn't be a lot for them to take away. So what do you think they did cover well um, in the debate? What issues uh, were, were covered pretty well? Well, really, the only issue that I thought was covered uh, reasonably well was the first one they talked about, and that was the economy where uh, Trump talked about uh, what he would do with trade and trade negotiations, uh, tax cuts, those sorts of things. Uh, and, and Clinton talked similarly about uh, those issues as well, obviously going in a little bit different direction than he did. But after that issue was, was covered, at least somewhat, the uh, issues such as uh, uh, national security, again, there was a little bit of discussion about that, but, but no real depth about what they would do terribly differently. Um, there were arguments over when uh, Trump uh, came out against the Iraq war, uh, arguments about everything else that became very personal. Right, and it seemed like there was a lot of, like, devolving had happened when they, they tried to talk about, like you said, about national policies, foreign relations, and ISIS. Particularly, um, it seemed that Mr. Trump constantly was interrupting Mrs. Clinton when she was trying to say, you know, check out my website for more details. He was like, yeah, just go check out her website. He was kind of like, um, I guess, upset that she was even providing any details, and he didn't, I noticed. Right, he did interrupt her a lot. Um, I felt sorry for the, for the moderator. Uh, because there was really very little that he could do to, to stop them. And he did make some attempt to uh, make the time as equal as possible, but uh, they were talking over him, talking over each other, interrupting uh, primarily from Mr. Trump, and uh, there was very little that, uh, that he could do to control the situation. 
I would not want to have been in Lester Holt's shoes. Could I mean, he, it seemed like he, you know, as an anchor and dealing with you know, difficult situations that, like you said, he tried. But how do you think he performed? Because I, I read reports, some said, okay, he did pretty well considering, you know, the, the two candidates who were very combative, obviously. And then some said, oh, he was like a potted plant and he could have done follow-ups. For instance, when uh, Mr. Trump said, hey, you know, I didn't pay my taxes. So what yeah. do you think about those? Well. Uh I think he did the best job he could. Mm -hmm. um, of course, Trump did not openly say, I didn't pay my taxes. He said he was smart uh, if, if you get away without paying taxes. It's being smart. Well, um, he, he probably could have followed up on that, but that was not uh, the major issue that was apparently being discussed during that segment. And so um, I, I think he had his script that he was trying to, to stay uh, close to and uh, may not have been quite as agile uh, uh, as he could have been, but at the same time uh, I, I think he had in mind the structure that he wanted and he, and he tried to stick to that. Um, he was put in a very difficult position because uh, neither one really stayed uh, within the confines of the time limits and of course uh, as we have said Trump continually uh, interrupted Hillary Clinton in, in her comments. He was. He was really just yelling wrong quite a bit and, and everything. So it was, it was just, it almost felt like, um, I don't know, like you were just in the middle of a, a play yard or, or we play, playground fight at school where these kids were trying to see who could yell the loudest. It really didn't seem like these were adults who were, you know, talking. Right, and, and I think uh, Mrs. Clinton uh, probably came to the debate wanting to uh, uh, antagonize uh, Trump at least a little bit. Uh, after all, she was the one who started the personal charges uh, first, the personal attack. And uh, I think there was a, a game plan on her part to antagonize him to, as we say, push his buttons mm -hmm. to, to get him to, to sound off, to uh, make him look bad, but also to try to uh, uh, bring up some of the uh, criticisms that uh, a wide variety of people have had about him. And, and at the same time, putting him on the defensive uh, so that uh, she would not be. Uh, I think her approach was that the best defense was a good offense. Right, and I think that really plays to her background as an attorney. It seems like she really did have that that strength of, of knowing how to debate versus his, like you said, being on the, on the defense a lot. And maybe as a businessman, he doesn't always have the experience of, of being in a, a public speaking situation like that, right? Right, and of course, he's not in a situation where he's used to those kinds of, of personal attacks either. Mm -hmm. Um, as, as a negotiator, he's talking about uh, business deals. He's not talking about his personal life. Right. Now, uh, back to or we kind of talked about who had strengths and who had weaknesses. I checked out some of the polls um, after the debate was over, and I looked at some polls that were like telephone surveys, and those tended to favor Mrs. Clinton, whereas the online polls tended to favor Mr. Trump. And I wanted to ask you, why do you think that disparity is? Well, there may be a, a certain amount of... Uh, economic bias there. Uh, we know that uh, Republicans tend to be, on, on average, a, a little bit wealthier than Democrats. And so um, I guess I would argue that Republicans, uh, Republican households are more likely to have computers, uh, more likely to be on computers, and, and uh, whereas uh, the, the Democratic households are, are more likely perhaps to, to not be and to respond more to, uh, to telephone polls. Mm -hmm, definitely so. And, and also there could be more of a concerted effort on the part of Republicans and Trump supporters to uh, uh, get online and to promote uh, Trump online as much as possible, perhaps believing that would reach a, a larger audience. Um, there tends to be this, this notion uh, among people who are uh, students of polling or at least observers of polling, students perhaps not a good word, but they tend to believe in, in what we often call in polling is uh, the uh, notion that if you convince someone that they did well in a poll, that, that, they'll, that they'll believe it, that they'll get on the bandwagon, so to speak, 
uh, and it is called the bandwagon effect, that if you can convince some people that someone did well, that that notion will spread. And I think that's to a certain extent what the Trump people were, were trying to do, perhaps online. I think you're probably right, definitely. Now, uh, to switch gears a little bit, um, back to about the pointed attacks that we had talked about. I understand that Clinton really, she really scared Trump on his attitudes toward women, uh, particularly. Uh, she mentioned the comment about where he called one of the beauty contestants, yes. Ms. Piggy, right. um, and really, you know, asked him about that. And then, um, you know, she even asked him about uh, how he had talked about she wasn't having a presidential look. So what do you think about those, you know, concerns about women and, of course, the, the large women electorate? Well, the, the personal attacks on someone's appearance, uh, I think, are um, off-putting to, to many viewers. Uh, it's not about how you look necessarily as president, whether you are, are glamorous, whether you are... Uh, thin, whether you are, are this or that. And for uh, Trump to be accused, and, and I, I might point out that uh, I don't know that there has been any um, evidence or, or tape, for example, of uh, him making those statements, calling her piggy or, or calling her uh, uh, essentially a housemaid. Uh, those may have been uh, passed orally, but, but certainly I've not seen any real evidence of them. Uh, using that kind of language, though, is not something which we consider obviously very presidential. Okay. It's uh, seen as, as defaming to people. And of course, among um, Hispanics, the fact that this, this young lady was a Hispanic, that she was uh, labeled uh, essentially a housekeeper, is uh, uh, certainly, I think, very uh, uh, defaming to, uh, to Latinos. Uh, it strikes at an image which is not uh, particularly, obviously, uh, uh, positive for right. them, and, and one which is uh, uh, unfortunately too stereotypical, uh, not necessarily true, because we have seen lots and lots of successful Latinos uh, in our society. On the other hand, um, calling uh, Hillary not particularly attractive um, is again something which uh, is meant to uh, uh, put her down from his side, but at the same time uh, is uh, something women don't want to be criticized for. Uh, you don't criticize women for their, their, for their weight, apparently. You don't criticize women for uh, their hair, for their, their face. Uh, women, uh, stereotypically, are to be attractive mm -hmm. and considered attractive and to uh, demean them in some way by, by calling them unattractive certainly, uh, I think, uh, is a way of, of turning women off and uh, making them less likely to vote for, for Trump. That seems to be his real weakness, is he just doesn't seem to know how to connect with, with women, particularly, and with, with uh, minorities also. I noticed, uh, Dr. Canervo, that he uh, seemed to try to sound like he was trying to be more friendly with African Americans. He was like, you know, I've got you know, lots of friends who are African American and everything, and then really didn't go into specifics about that, but it seemed like he was trying in that question about racial diversity and, of course, the racial issues that we've been facing here in the country recently, like he was trying to make some steps towards that. Um, what do you think about that, that tactic by him? Well, uh, of course, one of the stereotypes uh, is that uh, uh, whites will say, well, some of my best friends are African-American, Hispanic, or you know, whatever. And, and that scene is, is, is kind of a uh, uh, nothing line and that uh, it, it doesn't prove anything or say anything. And, and how do you prove that some of your best friends are this or that? Uh, one area which he uh, got into is, of course, the African-American neighborhoods, saying that they were very dangerous, mm -hmm. that there was a, a lot of crime there. And, and while obviously we have seen gang violence in Chicago, and a number of deaths and shooting in, in Chicago, 
the other side of that is that you're essentially then accusing African Americans of crime, of being criminals, of uh, not having good neighborhoods because of, of who they are. And that's seen, I think, as, as demeaning to African Americans as well. Not something which is, uh, builds them up, but shows positive, because obviously there are, there are lots of African Americans who are, who are very successful in society, who um, have nothing to do with crime, who, uh, who are, are, are well off financially. And so uh, to, again, paint that picture and, and, and create that stereotype is, is not necessarily seen very positively in the African American community. Definitely not. And it seems like there were a lot of, of, I guess it was a lot of war of words uh, there in the debate. And Mrs. Clinton made a good point there at the very end. And I think a lot of people really took that home. And she said, you know, words are very important. And then they can convey such an important message to, you know, our people, no, all the, the people that the Americans know in the world, in the world global community. And she talked about how important it was to put out the best uh, that we can. And she felt like Mr. Trump did not do that. Could you speak more about how that rhetoric and those words are so important? Sure. Well, well words do convey particular meanings, uh, particular images, uh, some of which may be positive, some negative. As a uh, diplomat, former Secretary of State, she is uh, certainly well aware of the importance of words. Um, diplomats are very careful in their choice of words. And, and so she understands that importance, um, I think certainly better than he does. To call someone uh, piggy, to, uh, to demean someone's appearance, um, sends a message that is, is terribly negative uh, about the person saying it. And so uh, he, as not being a politician, he's, he's used to being, uh, I think, obviously a businessman working behind closed doors where, where people can uh, nudge each other's elbows and say things which are either off color or demeaning or, or negative as kind of the quote unquote uh, old boys joke or, or backroom joke or you know, whatever it might be. Uh, not having run for office before, he's not used to the notion, I think, that, that words, whether they're meant to be public or private, are not going to be kept private. Certainly George Romney, or Mitch Romney, found that out four mm -hmm. years ago, or eight, four years ago, with his 47% comment. Right. Um, so you've got to assume that everything said in a campaign, whether it's meant to be public or not, uh, it's likely to get out. And words are hurtful. Uh, we have seen in our society the bullying problem mm -hmm. among uh, high school, elementary school, and uh, even college students. Mm -hmm. We know that uh, bullying words are very hurtful and can sometimes lead to suicides. Well. It, while perhaps not quite that extreme in the, in the political arena, what we do see is that words can be offensive. Words can be demeaning. And uh, it, it is very careful, it, it, very important to be careful with the words that are used. And how do you think uh, Trump can recover from that? Because obviously he probably alienated a lot of people when he was saying that, oh, you know, when I meant, I said presidential look, I meant just stamina. You know, he's trying to backpedal there and kind of skirt the issue. How do you think he can maybe win over people um, after those comments? Well, I think it's going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, the backpedaling uh, certainly is, is one route to take, but at the same time, the word is out there. The, the, mm -hmm. the film of what he has said is out there. And that's one thing he really hasn't understood, is that uh, he's been an, in a life which has been very visible. Mm -hmm. There's lots of tape out there of what he has uh, said in the past, going back many years, which can be uh, dredged up in today's computer age. And while he, of course, didn't anticipate 
those words being repeated or, or seen by others, uh, the fact is they can be in today's world. So to uh, backpedal from that is, is going to be very difficult for him. In many ways, it requires uh, a deep apology and then uh, a willingness to not do that again. Um, Trump seems to be someone who is not used to apologizing right. for what he says or does. And so, uh, for better or worse, that's part of his character, apparently, and part of his personality that uh, is, is going to be a, a negative factor for him. Now, there are some people who see him as positively as someone who uh, tells it as it is, mm -hmm. so to speak. But at the same time, uh, while there are some who may admire that, who want someone to uh, be uh, not so politically correct, politically, uh, in, in political dialogue, there are many who are offended by that. And I, and I would guess that the, the number of people who are offended is probably greater than the number of people who see that as a, uh, a positive character trait. And that brings up just uh, an informal poll that I conducted myself and kind of saw on social media after this um, happened. A lot of people were like, oh yeah, Donald's being himself. He's just letting it fly however he does. And then some were like, you know, Hillary seemed kind of snarky the whole time. And they were kind of like, well, this has been called, even I, I saw in the newspaper, the lesser of two evils debate. What does that, obviously that's a lot of millennials were saying that, what do you think that has to say about what's going to happen with the election? Will those millennials be disenfranchised, maybe stay away from the polls, maybe not go um, and cast their vote? Or maybe they'll go, a few have said maybe they'll go with independence. Well, the real fear is, of course, that uh, uh, younger people will stay home and not vote because they're turned off by both candidates. Mm -hmm. And, and I can understand that on the one hand, uh, but on the other hand, um, young people have more at stake in this election than anyone else. Uh, young people have potentially uh, 40, 50, 60 years ahead of them. These two candidates are different in, in the way they want to approach public policy whether it's uh, fixing the problem of, of college debt that young people have after they graduate, whether it's social services of one kind or another. Uh, there are a whole host of things that uh, these candidates will differ on. And it's, it's terribly important that young people understand that they do have a lot at stake in this election. And to just blow it off and say, well, four years from now, I'll have a better choice, or eight years from now, um, we'll have two different choices, and we can fix it then. Well, that's, that's a, a long time to wait, number, number one. And secondly, you don't know what could happen in the interim, the next four to eight years. One president can get us into a war that another president would not have. One president can set budget priorities that are different from what the other person would have set. And so there really is a lot of stake. Uh, unfortunately, um, youngest voters, those 18 to 25, have the lowest turnout rate. And that is a problem. And there are lots of reasons for that. Uh, they're trying to get their lives started, they're in school, they're away from home for the first time. There, there are lots of things that are going on. But at the same time, it's also a matter that they need to understand that it is a crucial part of their lives. They're wanting to buy houses, many of them, who are starting their first job. Well, what mortgage rates are, uh, the overall health of the, of the housing market, all of these things can be affected by who's president and their economic policy. And so it, it is crucial that uh, young people do turn out to vote. 
they, whatever analogy you want to use, they bite the bullet, they hold their nose, whatever. <laughs> they need to go to the, the, the polling place and make the best choice they can. And I know that uh, the uh, minor party candidates, uh, the Green Party candidate, the Libertarian Party candidates are, are choices. Um, and you, you can certainly vote for one of them as a, a, maybe a protest vote or as, as someone who you really think does represent your views. And I don't want to necessarily tell people not to do that because that's certainly part of democracy. It's part of our free choice. But at the same time, uh, realistically, one of those two minor party candidates doesn't have uh, much of a chance of being elected. And so it's a matter of really focusing attention on, if you want to call it the lesser of two evils, then, then do that. But nevertheless, uh, vote. Right, and it's very important that we all do that because yes. you know, we need to express, like you said, our choice no matter what, you know, what it is, what we think is best. Obviously, everybody's different. So. Absolutely. I mean, someone your age has a, a lot more years ahead of them than, than I do. And so uh, it's important that uh, you do what you can to create the kind of world and society that you want. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be beneficial to you and your family and the families of all the other young people. Definitely. And we want to remind everybody, of course, that it's probably going to be busy at the polls if, you know, if and when they go. Early voting starts pretty soon, October 19th. October 19th, that's right. Right. And I know they've got extended hours at the Election Commission, uh, 8 to 6 during the weekdays, and then 8 to 4 on the on weekday on Saturday. So that's Right. And, of course, we have lots of uh, students here at Austin P who are not from Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. And so they need to uh, make arrangements to, to go home and vote. And uh, while I've encouraged them to vote early, uh, at the very least, they need to go on, on Election Day. There are likely to be long lines on Election Day. Whereas they could go home to their, to their home county, uh, perhaps on a Saturday, mm -hmm. and, and vote. Right. It's important. Get, it, get out there and get your vote in. Absolutely. Now let's talk about endorsements, Dr. Canervo. Um, we've done a little research, and the Detroit Times, for the first time in its history, has endorsed an independent candidate, and then um, not a Republican, which is typically what they have done in the past, and then more telling the Arizona Republic, which is a very, obviously Arizona's very red state, very Republican-oriented with Senator John McCain and others, has endorsed Clinton. What do you think this means for Mr. Trump? I don't put a lot of stock in endorsements, particularly today. People uh, who read the newspaper are declining in number, number one. But also, uh, people, I think, are more likely to, to think for themselves and not necessarily vote because a, a newspaper editorial tells them to vote a certain way. So on one hand, I don't put a lot of stock that that's going to sway many votes. Uh, but secondly, it, it does send a message that uh, those two traditional papers are at odds with their traditional party leanings. And that says something about uh, how they view their party's nominee, which may be uh, more symbolic of, of how others in the party um, view him as well. This uh, election season reminds me an awful lot of the 1960s. Uh, 1964, uh, Barry Goldwater was a, a Republican nominee who also had a lot of uh, opposition within his own party among traditional Republicans. And he lost uh, very badly in the election. Um, now, there were a lot of different things going on. Lyndon Johnson, of course, had succeeded uh, to the presidency following the Kennedy assassination. He was fairly popular. He uh, had pledged not to send young men to Vietnam, mm -hmm. which he, of course, backtracked on. And so there were, there were lots of different scenarios going on uh, then than now. But the 60s were also a time of turmoil a time of uh, some violence in cities. 
And so there, there are at least a few similarities between today's um, time and, and the 60s. The election did not turn out well for Barry Goldwater and the Republican Party more generally. Whether that will happen this time, of course, remains to be seen, but that is certainly a, a possibility, and it's one of the fears that uh, Republican, more mainstream Republicans uh, uh, fear right now. Definitely, because I saw that Senator Ted Cruz said he would cast his vote for Trump, so it sounds like some, some big Republicans are still trying to keep some sort of unity, right? Right, right. Now, what we've got another debate coming up soon. What do you think that the candidates need to work on in the meantime preparing for that debate? Well, the format's going to be different where they'll be getting questions from the audience. Uh, I think one of the things both candidates need to do is to try to practice connecting with average citizens. Uh, there's going to be this uh, split screen where the audience member perhaps is, is asking questions to the candidates and there needs to be a, an appearance on the part of the candidates of some empathy to what the uh, citizen is, is asking about. There needs to be a, certainly an understanding of, of the issue, question, and uh, a willingness to respond in a way that is not uh, particularly uh, critical of the other candidate, because that does not answer the question, but rather uh, try to be as, as forthright as possible in answering what the citizen is concerned about, uh, rather than just simply uh, putting each other down uh, with personal attacks. And that's going to be really tough, I can imagine, for both of them because they both seem really intent on, you know, one-upping each other, at least. That's what it seemed like in this first one. So. Well, I think so. And, of course, that can still be done. You mm -hmm. can still give an answer and say, uh, but my opponent mm -hmm. has done this or said that in the past. And so there will be some of that, I'm sure. But it, it will be a much uh, smaller venue with uh, the audience uh, crowded up around the stage, at least as I understand it. And so uh, it, it will be a, a, a different uh, visual than what we've had with this, this first debate. And a visual that will make, I think, some difference in regard to candidates' warmth, their uh, ability to, uh, as I said earlier, connect to the audience. Definitely, and I'm glad you brought that up because I meant to ask you about that earlier. Um, looking at their appearances, uh, in the debate we had the split screen um, and we could see Mrs. Clinton on the one side, usually being pensive um, or just watching Mr. Trump. And then the other side, Mr. Trump seemed to be guzzling a lot of water um, throughout. And that was seemed just kind of, be, I don't know if that was a, had to dry a throat or if he was just nervous, but I thought that was interesting. I wanted to ask you what your thoughts were on that. I, I, I frankly don't have many thoughts about that. It seems to me that uh, how much water a candidate drinks is not a, is not a big deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, he may have been a little nervous. Uh, he may have been having uh, uh, a little problem. We heard him sniffling as well. Mm -hmm. Whether that was him or whether that was the mic, of course, we don't know for sure, but uh, it looked to be him. And so uh, it, it may be that he had a dry throat, that he was nervous, that, uh, and, and that's fine. I don't see that there's a, a problem with that uh, necessarily. Uh, people drinking water in public has uh, become almost a, a new norm. Mm -hmm. People bringing water with them wherever they go. So uh, I don't see that that was a, a negative for him. Uh, you know, had they been making faces or had he been doing something uh, much different, uh, that would have been another thing perhaps. But uh, I don't think the appearance of either one was a, a, a big issue. No, I just thought it was interesting, and I know this is probably just coincidence. I thought it was neat that he had on a blue tie, which is typically a Democratic, Democratic color, yes. and she had on the red, red. pantsuit, which yes. is typically a Republican color. So yes. I thought that was Well, I different. noticed that as well when they walked mm -hmm. out, and I was wondering whether that was uh, strategic or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it certainly might have been, uh, obviously trying to appeal to each other's party because uh, they both want crossover votes, mm -hmm. and they both could use crossover votes. 
They definitely could. Well, Dr. Panervo, thank you for stopping by. Did you have any other thoughts you wanted to share about the debate and the election? Well, uh, I, I guess I left the debate uh, a little bit uh, discouraged in that I, I'm sorry the debate did not do more with public policy. Public policy is a particularly important uh, issue of mine. Uh, I like to see what governments do or are planning to do. And uh, I was disappointed that the debate turned into the, the negative uh, drama that it did. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that the next debates will uh, be better. Um, but again, I, I can't overemphasize how important it is that people, uh, regardless of their beliefs, regardless of their party affiliation, uh, regardless of their age, uh, get out to vote. Uh, I believe very strongly in democracy, that this is our best chance as citizens to, to have a voice in the direction of the national government. And so while we cannot vote directly for any specific policy by necessarily voting for one candidate or the other, it allows us to vote for a direction that we want the country to go. And it's terribly important that people participate in that way. It really is. We all need to get out and vote. Yes. Like you said, make our choice. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Canerva. I really appreciate it. And, and thank you for stopping by. Well, thank you for having time. me. Thank you. And I'm Mike Otero with GovsTV and 91.9 Public Affairs. I'm Public Affairs.